here because you're in one of my favorite places in the district. You're talking about one of my favorite topics and your moderator is one of my favorite colleagues in politics, Randolph Townsend. Uh, you know, there's no uh, issue that's more important as we go into this election cycle, both here in the state and other states around the country and nationally than renewable energy. So it's quite a treat for us to have such a panel of experts here to talk about the nexus between that energy and economic development. So thank you all for being here and being part of this. Now some people may think that this topic is relatively new, but uh, to confess, Randolph and I have been working on this for quite a long time. Way back, I don't even know the year, but in the state legislature, Randolph chaired the Commerce Committee. He was in the majority, he had the power, and he had influential friends. I was in the minority, I had the commitment, and I had a reluctant group of people to bring along to the party. Nonetheless, we were very successful, I think, in helping Nevada lead the way when it came to uh, renewable portfolio standards, tax credits for energy, and also net metering. And I think y'all have probably heard a lot about net metering in, in uh, <laughs> recent months. So we, uh, we remain relevant, I guess, Randolph. I appreciate it. <laughs> they say in my poor southern French accent, plus ça change, plus cela même shows. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, nonetheless, this is a great topic for us to be addressing here in Nevada, and you're going to have a lot of things on the state agenda and coming pretty soon and in the next session, whether it is raising the cap on net metering, whether it's grandfathering in people who are already part of the program, extending tax credits, deregulating the power industry, so many issues, and yet they don't stand alone. They are connected to so many other things that you're addressing here in the state, whether it's bringing new industry like Tesla and Faraday, or just um, dealing with our own conservation and sustainability of our natural resources and our public lands. We also have some things going on at the federal level along these same lines, things that pop on and off the agenda, cap and trade, renewable portfolio standards nationwide, again, extension of tax credits for wind and solar, things that uh, shouldn't be controversial but always seem to <laughs> manage to, to become that way. Uh, I'm a, a strong supporter of all those things. I believe that sustainability is the key to the future and that Nevada is in a position to be a leader in this whole area. So again, it's a great pleasure for me to thank you for taking out the time to be part of this important issue, to thank our panelists who are certainly experts, whether it's just the business side, the environmental side, the manufacturing side, and also a delight for me to turn this over to Randolph Townsend. Well, Senator Tita, excuse me, it's going to be hard for me to get the Congresswoman part correct after 20 years with you. Um, she and I spent a great deal of time on energy issues uh, uh, and also uh, animal rights issues, of which are very, very fond of our hearts. And we concentrated on, on those and mental health, those things we had in common. And that's why we advanced the ball, and that's why the public policy that is currently the state of Nevada and has been for a long time uh, was, in fact, uh, moved along. It's not because we had disagreements. Uh, it was because we found common ground. And I think that those of you that hold office, uh, you may think your uh, constituents want you to go out there and rattle swords uh, and call the other person uh, a bad person, uh, or you can find a third party to do that for you. That doesn't advance uh, the issues of this country or the state or this community. Uh, now, if that doesn't get you elected, so be it. Um, there is life after elected office. Uh, I am still standing. My wife is still talking to me, and I can assure you my dogs absolutely adore me every time I come in the door. So uh, they, they could care less what, what title I have. Let's get started today. First of all, some preliminary remarks before I, I ask the question to these. Um, I realized in driving over here, I am uh, uh, two years away from my uh, 
40th year in dealing with energy policy. I didn't really want to think about that because every time I do, I got to realize that uh, number one, I'm mortal, and number two, I'm getting really, really old. Uh, but I can assure you, there are really opportunities here. You are going to hear from some people that I believe are going to help all of us advance energy policy, and it's policy. Over here on your left is a gentleman who's been a friend of mine for a long time, a consumer advocate head of the uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection, and they deal with rates. Today is not about rates. It's about the correct policy. As the Congresswoman said, it's about putting all those little things together. I think we can do it. What we're gonna focus on today is a simple thing. What does energy policy mean for economic development and vitality in the state of Nevada? We'd all like to have more viable jobs, more viable businesses, uh, we'd like to have more revenue for the needs that the state and communities have through tax revenue. We'd like to have that. That comes with growth. So today we're going to focus on that. And we're going to ask them a simple question. Uh, and by the way, we're only going to have basically two questions today. I want to save a couple of minutes for questions from you. And then I'm going to ask the last question. And hopefully it's going to be one we're sticking around for because it may have some controversy with it. Uh, I happen to have been thinking about this for the last 10 years. Uh, I kicked it around 10 years ago in the legislature and uh, my colleagues kicked me back along with some lobbyists and I still think it's a very viable idea. So we're gonna discuss it today, but that's the last thing on our agenda. So when we start, I'm gonna ask each one of you to, uh, uh, before you answer the question, please just take a moment, tell the audience who you are. Uh, and then um, we'll start to take about two minutes each uh, to answer the question. Why is it important that Nevada's energy policy be correct at this time? And we'll start with whoever has, I guess, uh, Mr. Aguero. Uh, welcome, and we'll give you the first shot since uh, we're talking about economic development and you run numbers and you analyze things. Let's go ahead and start with you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Jeremy. I'm an analyst for the company called Applied Analysis here in Las Vegas. Um, why does the policy have to be correct? I, I think it's relatively simple and straightforward, to be honest with you. I mean, from my perspective, and I realize I'm the numbers guy and everything I'll translate back to that, but it means jobs, it means wages and salaries for working families, and it means increased economic output. Look, we're either going to be ahead of this curve or we're going to be behind this curve. And I think the great work of you and a number of your colleagues sitting here and some of the folks sitting up on this panel as well, if not all of them, have made incredible strides in that direction. But if we don't have the policy right, we're not going to get the investment. And if we don't get the investment, we're not going to generate the energy. And if we don't generate the energy, we're never going to get the manufacturing and the other economic development that comes along with it. Right. It was mentioned earlier about one particular company wanting to develop more in terms of renewable energy because that's good policy for them. It's a good business practice for them. And that's not only because they're thinking about what the cost is today and what the jobs are today, but businesses think in 30-year chunks. They don't leave, think like we often do from a legislative standpoint in two-year chunks. And, and, and that, that I'm not meaning to make that sound pejorative by any stretch of the imagination. I think that a lot of energy policy that the legislature has taken on was very forward-looking. But if we start to think 30 and 40 years down the road, what happens when the cost of the inputs go up dramatically? What happens when um, energy is not as plentiful from traditional resources as it was before? What happens when we start doing the full accounting for the potential impacts associated with traditional energy infrastructure? Those type of things have real measurable impacts in terms of jobs, in terms of wages and salaries, and in terms of economic output, whether that's in terms of dollars that are invested or how much we generate from the economy that we have on the ground today. Terrific, thank you. Let's go next to Steve Hill. Uh, Steve, welcome. Uh, you are the governor's point person on economic development, which uh, uh, this governor has made a priority. He chose you to head that up. Uh, you have probably been in the press uh, more than the Congresswoman and, and I together. So uh, with that, uh, please go ahead. So I gotta start with a couple of things. One, Jeremy, the lowly analyst at Applied Analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the great Jeremy Aguero. <laughs> Secondly, I am more than a little embarrassed that I was not included on the Yellow Tide memo. 
But my name is Steve Hill. I'm the director of the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here today. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, many of you belong up here with us. Uh, you're also leaders in, uh, in energy policy and clean energy in the state. Um, and to a large extent, we're following you, taking our cues from you. Um, one thing I'll mention, and, and it's come up a couple of times already, um, this needs to be a bipartisan effort, and in Nevada it has been. Um, our governor has included uh, clean energy policy throughout his uh, tenure and his job. Um, recently, a uh, new strategic plan for the state uh, was published out of the governor's office, um, and clean energy plays a prominent role in that strategy um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, and certainly that is uh, related to the health of our citizenry, uh, but it is also related to economic development. Um, when we started this effort five years ago, um, our, you know, our focus was on creating jobs and allowing the industry itself uh, to flourish here. We've got the resources, we have that opportunity. We saw that as good business, it made sense. Um, over the past five years though, um, that thought process in economic development has really changed. Um, we are fortunate to have companies like Tesla and Faraday here uh, leading that charge. Uh, we have talked recently a lot about the future of transportation happening in Nevada, and it is. Uh, we are one of six uh, states or one of six locations uh, that are test sites for unmanned aerial vehicles. We have Hyperloop One here. Um, we have, we've recently um, put together the Center for Advanced Mobility. All of those technologies are electricity based. Um, we need the renewable energy component to help drive what is a really a much larger industry forward. Um, we've talked about the fact that really Nevada makes sense to build what Silicon Valley designs. Um, it's hard to manufacture in California at this point. It is much easier to do so in Nevada. Uh, we have a living example of that right here. Um, in order to do that, we have to be attractive to those companies. Um, we need, in our business case, access to renewable energy, the ability for those larger companies to be able to construct it themselves and, and take advantage of that. Uh, just last week at the Small Business Conference, Adam was one of the speakers and talked about the fact that data centers currently take two and a half percent of the energy in the United States and within the fairly near future, that will be up to 10%. Every one of those data center companies and that's, you know, data center firms themselves like Switch, uh, it includes Google and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft. All of those companies want to power what they're doing with clean energy. Uh, if we don't offer that, we don't have, we not only don't have those jobs in the state, we don't have the jobs that come from the companies that are more and more uh, caring about um, clean energy uh, availability and access uh, power and what they do. So, great. Uh, we now have uh, someone who is, uh, represents a company near and dear to my heart. Uh, many of you know, I'm a car guy. Grew up that way. I uh, can't help it when you're uh, born and raised in Los Angeles and end up uh, racing cars. Uh, not necessarily well, but uh, I did race them. And uh, this is a lady that hopefully can give us some insight into not only her experience, but what companies like hers are looking for when they either want to expand or they want to relocate to the state of Nevada. Anyway, uh, on behalf of the Gaming Commission, uh, welcome to the state of Nevada. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sarah Van Cleef. I manage our West Coast Energy Policy at Tesla. And I, I have to say uh, a big thank you to you all for welcoming us to Nevada. We are so excited that it worked out with the state. And you know, there were so many reasons that we wanted to come here. Um, but certainly one of my favorites and, and one that's very relevant to this group is just the abundance of renewable energy, the promise here. Of all the sites that we looked at for the Gigafactory location, 
The site up outside of Reno had the best renewable resources. We have great solar there, good wind, fantastic geothermal. Um, for companies like ours, whose mission is core to moving towards sustainable energy, that was really important. And it, it's beyond just advanced energy companies. Certainly, you want to attract advanced energy companies here. Um, I saw a stat the other day that advanced energy companies, uh, it's now a $1.4 trillion industry, which is twice that of air. So really an enormous industry, and Nevada can be the, the center point of that industry, um, but also for regular companies. I, I saw another stat, I was prepping for this, and you know, I'd like to bring some fun facts. Um, another one was that 60% of Fortune 100 companies have clean energy or climate goals. So it's really important to a lot of different sides of the industry. Um, so that, that's one reason, in addition to economic development, uh, that, that Nevada and its interest in energy policy right now is so important. Um, I'll also add just the interest from people here is fantastic. I, I get to spend time in a number of states, but only in Nevada will my Uber driver, his ears will perk up when I say, oh, I work in energy. He wants to talk about solar, really wants to learn more. And so it's so fantastic that the folks here want to have that conversation, are really interested in the changes in energy policy. Great, I want to uh, pass this on uh, to your CEO, uh, chairman, owner, etc., whom I've never had a chance to meet. But as someone who invests and has for many years in the auto industry, and someone who's uh, probably bought enough cars to make sure that everybody here had something to drive, um, and continues to be a bit of a car nut, I want to thank him because I can assure you, uh, it wasn't Toyota, which was a company for whom I worked for many years, uh, and it wasn't some of the others, whether it be Fisker or some of the others. It was Tesla that changed the industry. Uh, there is a paradigm going on in that industry. If you read anything about whether it's General Motors or whether it's Mercedes or it's, it's uh, Lexus or Toyota, uh, Tesla has changed that world. Uh, and you will see over the next five years the result of what Tesla has brought to the industry. There will not be a car company on the face of the planet who does not have an all-electric car in the next five years. Now, that's a huge advancement, and that was driven by the success uh, of Tesla. So we're really glad to have you in Nevada, and as a guy who spent uh, 40 years, I hate to say of my adult life, because according to my wife, I still, I'm still a kid, so uh, at least I act like that. Uh, thanks for going to Northern Nevada. It means a lot to both of us uh, in the North. Uh, the next uh, gentleman who would like to ask that same question is the one that I'm hoping to get a global view of, uh, is Todd Foley. Um, what are other states doing? What are you seeing as someone who does this uh, nationwide? What can we learn and what can we put into action? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Todd Foley. I'm with the American Council on Renewable Energy. We represent the entire U.S. Uh, and the global, for the most part, the renewable energy sector both uh, manufacturers, developers, as well as investors, financiers, utilities, and others, including users of renewable energy like Amazon, Google, and other companies that are increasingly interested in the goals we're talking about here today. Um, first, I have to say uh, you know, a big thanks to Senator Townsend and to former Senator Titus, Congressman Titus, because uh, I was with uh, BP uh, for a number of years prior to this current job, and BP at one time was the largest solar and wind developer in the world. It was biofuels had a lot of fun uh, working on those issues for many years. But uh, I probably had the most fun uh, about 15 years ago working with the two senators then on the Nevada RPS. Uh, I came, I grew up here in Las Vegas. Uh, family's been here in Nevada for a long, long time. It was really great to come home to work on uh, the renewable energy standard here. And uh, so uh, without the bipartisan support, not only would we not have renewable energy here in Nevada, but I think we, we would not have the kind of activity that's going on in the rest of the country, uh, and even beyond. So there needs to be common ground and all these issues I pointed out, Senator, are very, very important. Um, I would just note one last thing. Uh, you know, for Senator Townsend's leadership here a number of years ago, uh, when he was chairman of the committee, uh, we, uh, in the solar industry at the time, named him the National Legislator of the Year, if you will recall. I still hope you have that plaque somewhere, you know, prominently displayed, but, uh, anyway. But anyway, uh, I think Nevada is a great place uh, when you think about all these issues. Um, I, I would just start with uh, Nevada is the Saudi Arabia of Reno 
renewable energy. Think about it, solar, geothermal, wind, it's an incredible resource here. Uh, remember, energy is key to light, heat, heat, maybe air conditioning in Las Vegas, and mobility. So it really underpins everything. And the resource here is amazing because that's money. That's money, that's, that's investment. Whether it's uh, sunlight, the wind blowing, these are all resources to be harnessed to support these very important economic other needs that we have that Steve has touched on and represented by Tesla and others who, are, who need this energy, along with companies like Switch, MGM, and Wynn and others who need this energy to carry on, but it's really their core business. Energy oftentimes is the largest single uh, uh, fixed cost that, that uh, these companies have. So it's very important that they have choice, access to alternatives, so they, they pay the, the lowest uh, uh, rates they can for energy. And it's the same thing for homeowners. Um, I would add that uh, you know policy is really the signal to the market uh, on where to put resources, whether it's people's time or their money. So we do need to get the, why do we need to get the policy right? Because it is the signal to the market. It's the signal to investors uh, like, and developers like uh, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, and others on where they're going to put their resources. And it's very important that we have long-term consistent policy to help, uh, help do that, help companies make the decision to come here. The good news here, of course, we've had bipartisan leadership, as evidenced by the two congressmen and uh, former senator. Current Governor Sandoval has made this a very high priority. We know that on a national level. And I would I just add, you know, there are a lot of current issues that the state's grappling with, and that metering comes to mind, and, and where do we want to go with these issues in the future? Uh, I would just note that, you know, when you think about uh, the, the forces arrayed here, it's really quite amazing in Nevada. You have the titans of industry involved in these key issues. You have Warren Buffett, who oversees Enemy Energy, Berkshire Hathaway's CEO, Elon Musk, leading Tesla, Solar City, and SpaceX changing the planet and the world in so many ways. We also have companies like, people like Steve Wynn, Wynn, who are using more and more renewable energy. MGM, Shell and Adelson at Sands, uh, titans of global industry, not just Nevada industry, all here. But I think that if we can come together on a lot of these issues, harness this huge resource so that we can support, make sure companies like Switch, Amazon, Google, and others have the energy they need affordably, provide reliable, resilient energy, Choice, choice is very important for homeowners and businesses. And of course, we'll get a cleaner environment as a result as well. So I, I think that's like a, you know, hitting a grand slam and it's key, uh, I think, going to uh, the future going forward. So sorry, Senator, I'll stop there and look forward to uh, you know, carrying on and getting into these, some of these issues more specific. Great, we're gonna go back to Steve Hill, but I wanna try to set this up. Uh, first of all, when you talk about energy policy, I think the easiest thing to do is pull back Congresswoman, thank you. Appreciate it very much. I, I didn't want to embarrass her, but I'm going to tell a story that I think is really important <laughs> on how you get stuff done. Uh, during one of our many discussions, we found out we not only had a common interest in the things I've already discussed, but we had a common interest in the movies. And she and her mom were huge movie people. And my wife and I are big movie people, so every weekend I'd fly down to see my wife. We would see uh, uh, Dina and her mom at the movies. And we spent a lot of time talking about the movies and why were they were made the way they were, were they any good, did we like that genre, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you develop a relationship, because you get to know the things that you have in common with somebody else. That really helped continue to cement the relationship we've had to this day on issues. Um, and so for those of you that hold office, you gotta learn how to do that. I know it's not easy because you only have 12 years. Thank you very much for term limits, really appreciate it. Um, uh, but that, that's what you have to do. You have to learn how to work with people. If you don't, you won't be successful in politics and you certainly won't be successful if you're in the regulatory environment and you won't be successful in business. Uh, you don't have to agree with everybody on anything, but find those little nuggets that you can't agree on and polish them and work on them, and you'll do fine. This gets to the bigger picture, and this is why we're having this uh, dialogue today. What kind of community do we want? What kind of business do we want here? Where do we want to go? Who do we want living next to us? Who do we want coming into this state, not just with their capital, 
but with their human resources to provide services and goods in the state of Nevada that makes it better for us. And why? You may want a Starbucks on your corner. I don't think that's gonna change much. But I think the bigger question is the one of what type of community and state do we want? Who do we want living next door to us? Who do we want investing in our community? And I'm gonna give that to uh, Mr. Hill. Thanks, Senator. Um, our focus has um, and remains and actually is um, we're putting more emphasis on bringing really good jobs for really all Nevadans, but the trying to raise wages. I mean, really, ultimately, from an economic development standpoint, increasing the average wage in Nevada is what we're really trying to do. Um, five or six years ago, we were just trying to find people a job. Um, at this point, many more people have, have work and they have options, um, but I've been here almost 30 years and the options for our kids, for ourselves, um, have been fairly narrow. Uh, you know, the tourism and hospitality industry is a great industry. It's gonna be the economic driver for the state for a long time. Um, but if you didn't wanna go into the tourism and hospitality industry, um, your choices could be somewhat limited. And you know, we saw our kids you know, go off to different states to, to pursue what they wanted. We don't want that. Um, the, the type of businesses that we've been able to attract in Nevada, and you know, obviously Tesla is one of the, well, the premier example of that. They're bringing 6,500 jobs, although if you listen to Elon, it's going to be 10,000 instead. That sounds just great. Um, the average wage for those jobs uh, is somewhere between 25 and 30 dollars an hour. So between 52 and $62,000 a year for the average job in that facility. Uh, that's what the governor talks about when, he, when he's talking about the new Nevada. Uh, we are, in several areas, now on the cutting edge of these technologies, and the cutting edge of these technologies is where real prosperity lies and where great jobs are. Uh, it also broadens just the spectrum of opportunities in the state uh, and helps us keep our kids here with the talent that they have. So um, we want our kids living next door to us is one of the answers to that question. And, or at least close, maybe not quite <laughs> next door, but, <laughs> but around so we can see them. Um, but um, the clean energy portion of that is drawing that cutting edge technology and those cutting edge companies here. Um, and that's really helped helping to drive wages higher in the state and helping to create more opportunities. Great. Um, I want to leave the last person to be able to address that to Mr. Aguero because he can give us some insight with regard to what it means once you look globally, what it means financially. So I'm going to go to Sarah. Having um, affected a community and a state by bringing in uh, those individuals and that capital that you brought in, why don't you tell us about who you would like to see and why, particularly relative to Tesla? Sure, yeah, I mean, up in northern Nevada, uh, we have found a ton of great folks in the workforce. We've brought some up from southern Nevada, and these really are, are highly skilled folks, and increasingly so, in a lot of training because the manufacturing that's happening there hasn't happened in the U.S. for decades. So really, you know, bringing uh, back an industry, really skilled folks, again, well-educated at all the great institutions here that we've been working with as well to do some research. Um, so, you know, generally, I think that the clean energy industry, uh, both on the, the business side as well as the manufacturing side, because it is advanced, it's not our uh, rudimentary fossil fuels that we've been using for 100 years. It, it really is uh, new and requires a lot of new sharp thinkers. So that's who we have up at the Gigafactory and hopefully we'll have more and more of those folks coming up here soon. Great. Well, I think the first Tesla I saw and drove was at that energy conference in uh, Silicon Valley. I think it was in San Jose. Uh, that's where they debuted the car, I think, originally. Uh, scared me to death. Uh, <laughs> I think that was before you were born, but Todd gave me that award a long time ago. But it was 
pretty exciting time to see uh, the first time I saw that, uh, and then of course the evolution. So, uh, Todd, what do you think? You you are a very unique individual because of your family history here. You're not only historic as a family, but iconic as a family, and yet you've spent time uh, in the East, and you've spent time in a lot of states, and now hopefully you're home for a while. Uh, why don't you give us your insight with regard to the, the type of people, companies, uh, direction you think we ought to be going? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, the, uh, the, it's a huge opportunity I think Nevada has to build on this uh, great leadership that we've seen in the legislature years ago, creating the policy, the early signals, uh, leading to uh, the recent success in, in uh, landing uh, the investment by Tesla and Switch and others. Uh, but, th but this is just the beginning, the beginning, I think, of where things are headed. Uh, you look at what's going on around the U.S. and even globally. Uh, this, this is, I think, is very important, and that is in a great position to help lead in a really an energy transformation. It's already begun, uh, but it's going to accelerate. It's not visible everywhere, but we're, we're going to see it more and more. Uh, as uh, right now, uh, there's projections. Uh, we've invested in the U.S. now about one. $2 trillion dollars in, uh, uh, in uh, renewable energy over the last uh, 10, 11 years or so, about $44 billion last year. But the projections are that we're, as, a, as a planet, we're going to be investing $12 trillion over the next 25 years in energy infrastructure. And 60% of that is going to be going to renewable energy. So this really is the, the growth sector for the future in terms of energy. And here, this, this uh, area enjoys a huge resource to tap into. It can you play a very important role in that. So I think if uh, we get the policies right, the signals to the market, uh, we'll see this. Uh, the, there, in our group, my, in our membership at uh, American Council on Renewable Energy, we include all the major investors and financiers in renewable energy. Big, huge brands, global brands, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, City, you name it. They're major players in renewable energy. They have plenty of capital. The issue is where they're going to put the capital. Uh, I would just note that over the last, uh, since 2008, more than half of the new energy that's deployed in the U.S. has come from renewable energy. So while we're very excited, people are excited to say natural gas industry, renewable energy actually is outpacing natural gas. Wind is now the cheapest source of new power in the United States, and in certain areas like Nevada, in Arizona, California, and other places, Solar is right there. We had we had solar bid at three, four, five cents a kilowatt hour. So these technologies are there. The issue is what? How are we going to develop them? How are we going to create the market forces to allow investors and developers to bring these technologies to, to bear? And Steve and the governor did important work there, and I think that's important. I think that the other part of it too is consumers want access, as we've noted. Uh, I think the next, the big, next new dynamic in the market, you see it here, but it's not well understood yet everywhere. But that's like homeowners and businesses. The businesses here like MGM and Switch, they want access to renewable energy. For many companies, access is becoming a, a, a key decision point on where they invest. Uh, Amazon's a member of ours. They now will only invest in, in places where there's access to significant amounts of renewable energy. We're seeing that in lots of other companies as well. So uh, the great news is Nevada, the leadership here on a bipartisan basis, is making this place a great place in, to invest in, and people are following suit. But I think we're just at the front end of all that, and, uh, and I think the, uh, the, the future is bright. Again, I would just note that there are a number of places in the U.S. where uh, renewables are a huge amount of energy production. It's 31% uh, in Iowa, just larger than wind. Texas has a huge amount of renewable energy being developed. We all know that California. And Nevada is uh, up and coming as well. So this is the future. This is where, where we actually not only see that modern energy supply, but also affordable electric rates, because these sources are, are renewable energy are actually the cheapest in the marketplace going forward. So not only do we provide access to companies that find it very important to manage their costs, but we actually have a, a downward pressure on electric rates for everybody else in the community. That's another as well. So. Great. And our last person to address that question will be, uh, he always is called a numbers guy, and I, I think that does disservice to a guy that's very bright. I know I've worked with him for many years and signed a few checks to him as the head of the legislative uh, commission. 
because we thought he was smart enough to win for the 63 of us. Uh, but Jeremy, I would really like for you to address the issue of the type of uh, state we want and what's the difference between what the past has been and, and what we're looking to do in the future based on decent uh, and correct energy policy. Sure, I, I think that's probably the most important question we can ask. Where do we want to be? Right? We have sort of one foot planted in the past and the other one striving toward this future that, that we all believe is pretty bright. Um, and I'll certainly defer to the definitions uh, in terms of economic diversity and development. Steve uh, knows more about it than almost anybody in the country. But it, when I think about economic development and economic diversification, I try to bifurcate them into two different things. One is economic diversification, the idea that our economy today in the state of Nevada remains among the narrowest economies of our size in the United States. And that isn't intended to be a criticism by any stretch of the imagination. I think Steve and the governor and the legislators have done more in terms of economic development than probably anybody in the country today, and we're all operating in their debt. But the other side of that is economic development, right? And for me, economic development, at least in my mind, means businesses that are here today and making them as profitable and as um, likely to succeed as possible on a go-forward basis. Um, Steve talked about the idea of increasing wages and salaries. That means we have higher wage consumers that can do more things and, and produce more, whether it's the Starbucks on the corner or um, Tesla or Switch expanding and moving in. That's all wonderful for us and it's great. Um, the idea that what do we want Nevada to look like, um, we've spent the better part of the past seven years recovering from the Great Recession. I sort of said before I wasn't going to talk about that anymore and I, I will try to do it as little as possible. But it strikes me that it's important to this question that you're asking that we lost roughly one out of every six, one out of every six private sector employees in Southern Nevada we lost during that downturn. And a big part of that was because of how narrow our economy was, completely dependent upon construction and tourism, both of which were directly impacted. In the construction industry, we lost two out of every three employees that we had. That's something I don't ever want to have happen again. I, I don't ever want to go into a room and see, you know, people that you expected to be there not be there because they've had to leave. They do. That's not what Nevada is all about. And I think making sure that, that who we want to have in the state are the people that are here today. And we've heard it. Companies like Tesla, companies like Switch, companies like Google, renewable energy is important. It is a critical consideration in terms of where they're going to invest uh, on a go-forward basis. So if we look backward like you asked, and then we look forward, we see exactly what we have to do. Diversify our economy so that we can withstand an economic downturn, and at the same time, create an environment that means that Nevada businesses have the ability to develop and prosper as well as anywhere in the country. I think that should be our principal goal. Now the second half of your question, I think goes to the question of, of, of I put it in my own context. Um, my family's been here in Southern Nevada since 1905. My grandfather immigrated from Cuba in the late 1950s and moved from Florida to uh, Las Vegas like any number of Cuban families did uh, during that time frame. And my, why did my grandfather move here? Right? He moved here because he worked in the hotel industry in Havana and this area provided the greatest opportunity for him of anywhere he could have for my grandmother and himself and my uncle and my father. And that's why he came here in the early 1960s. And, and we've been here uh, ever since, my mom's family before that. But here's the reality, is that people are coming anyway. Here today we sit in the Las Vegas area, and we are the fifth fastest growing metropolitan area in the country today. We are growing faster than almost everywhere in the entire United States. Those folks are coming. And for the same reason that my grandfather decided to leave Havana and come ultimately to Las Vegas because he wanted a better life for his family. And I think Nevada has always been the place that says we can provide a better life. And that part of that is being progressive relative to our policy, being prepared to have a broader construct of what our job market looks like and what those opportunities really look like. And if anyone believes that energy isn't an, a critical component of that and progressive energy policy isn't important, Part of that, I think they're just turning a blind eye to the reality that the future will be. Excellent. I want to lastly allow uh, Mr. Hill uh, to address the following question. There is nothing more exciting than coming to a, 
a group like this who are interested in an issue that's important and listening to the, uh, the insight that are provided by you know, people with expertise. But in Senator Titus's and my role, uh, you've got to turn it into action. We talked about what the policy is and how do we get it correct? How do we do it? What are we going to do? What is your role? So I'm now going to turn it back over to uh, to Mr. Hill as, as the head of economic development for the government. What would you like to see happen, either locally or statewide, in the next, say, 12 months, which includes, of course, the legislative session? Well, I, I actually was going to interrupt before we got done and unsolicited kind of address the same question you just asked, Senator. Um, so I, I appreciate you allowing me not to be rude. Um, one of the things, and I, I, I've talked with the folks at Tesla about this, I've talked uh, with the folks at Switch, we, we have leaders in this state in this field, and they're helping to lead the policy. And, and it, it, that creates an economic development opportunity all by itself. We, we're, we're able to take advantage of the fact that these companies are here and are um, helping to drive Nevada in this direction. Um, but what I've talked to them about, and I think what's important as a starting point to answering that question, is frankly the, the experts and the proponents in this field need to help folks like me who are not uh, understand what you mean and what you need. Um, and it, it was one of the reasons that um, Tesla had a meeting uh, probably six or eight months ago at the Gigafactory because I had talked with them about the fact that, frankly, I don't know what, what you're upset about at the time, what you're looking for at the time. I don't know what that looks like. Um, and this policy is going to evolve. We need help. And I, we've got legislators here who coming into this session are going to have to make these decisions. They need to understand not only the specific aspects of that decision, but where are we trying to go with our energy policy? What's that look like? Battery technology is going to change this landscape dramatically, probably now within about two and a half years. Uh, when, when batteries are available to supplement renewable energy, the equation completely changes. Um, right now, it would probably be foolish for us to have a goal of more than about 20% renewable energy because we'd all go broke if it went past that. Um, once we have batteries, that 20% number either is raised dramatically or disappears. Um, how that fits into um, whether that's um, community solar decisions, um, utility scale solar, uh, how our transportation works, uh, how all of that links together are not only decisions we're going to have to make in the next 12 months, but we need to have an idea in all those policy decision makers' minds of collectively where are we headed, what are we trying to accomplish. Um, I don't know that we know those answers yet, um, and uh, over the next several months, uh, we're going to need your help in order to um, understand not only how we calculate what the net metering rate ought to be for the next two years and whether that ought to apply for a longer period of time or not, but how does that step in the process lead to um, what really is going to help drive that forward? Well, I appreciate that. I want to uh, close this. Um, is there someone who has the most insightful question in the world? Because we only have time for one. Uh, what is yours about? And who's it addressed to? Sir, what's yours about? Uh, the total picture of how energy diversity relates to homes, uh, food, transportation. Okay, both good energy. questions. We'll answer. We'll try to answer that. Go ahead. Anybody want to take either one of those? <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Can I ask, your, your question's pretty broad. Is it okay, man? can I take that? That was intended. 
Oh, okay. See, I'm not running for anything, so I can be like that. No, don't. Go, go ahead. Please ask your question. Part of finding clean energy and creating by paying jobs, you have to apply it to efficient buildings and efficient processes in your behavior industry. And right now, we're cutting back on the incentives for energy efficiency in the state. So it seems like you're sending the wrong message to the marketplace by doing that, number one. Number two, I don't know what the right metering policy is, but what would happen to you or going to state is sending the wrong message to the people you want to locate here and drive to the state. Let me, let me address the first thing because I think it's important. That's an excellent question and one that we didn't touch on today, but I'll close with it in the end. The whole issue of, of energy efficiency is always lost. It's always lost in this debate, and it's so crucial in Southern Nevada. When I look at um, particularly seniors or those on fixed income or those that are disabled that have to swelter in a home or in an office or a therapy session is inexcusable. So I think local government, and that may have to be driven from the legislature, has to be told you don't get to do the standard codes anymore. Nevada is not going to tolerate that. Uh, we tried that. We were shut down by, you know, in, in a bipartisan effort, they made a bad decision to stop that from happening. And it needs to go forward because your question is as important as any question about this. And that's once you get clean energy, is it efficient? So I'll answer that. I don't know if you want to give it a second. Look, I'll, I'll make my best effort to do it, and I may take it from a little bit of a different angle. So, um, look, uh, renewable energy is important from an economic development standpoint because of jobs and those type of things, but it also has to work for business and, 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 and for individuals. Um, so my take is a little bit different from the standpoint that I'm actually encouraged by the fact that we are having the debate that the, the, the groups of people like this are there and that we are arguing about what these amounts should be and what those building standards should be. That is exactly the way the process is intended to work. It can't just be one-sided where someone establishes it. It can't just be the side where the, someone just says no. But finding that middle ground and having that conversation from a purely economic standpoint is exactly the kind of progress I think we would like to see in terms of where the state of Nevada is. Todd, you want to say something? Sorry, Sarah. Yeah, just to add to that and maybe to address both questions, I, I just wanted to point to the great work that the Governor's Task Force did and I was on the, I had the privilege of being on one of the technical advisory committees and, and the level of detailed discussion about what are the right energy policies, not just on one resource, you know, not just solar, but on energy efficiency, on large scale renewables, on battery energy storage, it was really fantastic and I think will we'll set the stage for some good further discussions. And, and it's not gonna be um, you know, policy that focuses just on one resource, just on energy efficiency, just on renewable. There's a lot of pieces that have to fit together, especially as we move towards a more distributed grid that's cleaner and more resilient and cost effective. So um, I, I think that those conversations are, are really starting to be had, especially at the detailed level. And, and I'm excited for what's to come here soon. Uh, all three are, I think, absolutely correct. And, you know, Steve, I think you laid it out very nicely. Um, the energy transition is, has begun, it's taking place, where, you know, a lot of these technologies are moving forward. But the real issue is about pace and scale. Like, what does this look like? And I think, uh, you know, Steve, uh, the key here really, and I think you put the, hit the, the uh, nail on the head there, is bringing people together to get, um, to, to map out the path forward that does take into uh, consideration where we're at today, where this technology is at, how do we better align the cost and price signals going forward. And there's no question here, and I think this is the challenge for that, that there is a win-win. Um, you know, all of the parties that are involved in the current uh, electricity discussion are going to be necessary for the solution. You know, NV Energy provides a critical service for grid support and making sure that the lights stay on. Customers, homeowners and businesses want choice. Their choices are increasing and it's their cost competitive. So how do we balance that? There's also, this is not gonna happen all overnight. It's gonna be a transition. It's gonna have to be managed. What is the pace and scale of this, uh, this transformation that we're talking about? Taking into consideration you know, all the elements here that we've been talking about.
talking today. That, I think, is the challenge, but that's a huge opportunity to bring people together and craft that win-win, which is out there. So, very exciting uh, future. Uh, sure. I'm waiting. My question is rhetorical. Let's, what we build right now, the houses, wood and stuff on R22, uses a lot of energy to keep it cool. There's new technologies from the military, from NASA. That was going to be R60. You don't need heating or air conditioning from 100 degrees down to minus 20. These are the things that bring it all together. Right? We have a dozen energy technologies that haven't been explored here. here. We should be exporting energy to the rest of the country. There's no reason we can't send out and dozens of gigawatts every month. It's easy. <laughs> well, I, I think your point is well taken, uh, and I think you're accurate uh, to the issue of the codes. Uh, the legislature needs to sit with local government before the next session and decide whether they're going to local government's going to make the changes for building or whether the legislature is going to make them make the changes. That's the reality of politics. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be nice to everybody, but, you know, um, it, 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 that, that's how it works after my 30 years there. So what you have to do as an audience is drive this. Legislators aren't going to do this on their own. This is not sexy. This is not something that gets them elected. They're going to be dealing with background checks, marijuana, Whatever sexy the taxes, whatever sexy the time, the stadium, you know, what, whatever. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> um, uh, listen, I was born in Los Angeles. I got my team back. Whatever happens to the Raiders, up to you guys. Uh, so, so please, please help them drive this. Unless you're in their ear, they're not going to pay attention. And there are some friends of mine are sitting here that are elected. And believe me, I'll be in their ear. So I think it's important that you continue to drive it. And I want to close with this. It doesn't mean that you fall on the old ways. Let's go back to 1980, when I introduced the initiative to create the Office of Consumer Advocate. 1980, have you? More than that, weren't born then. Okay, we finally got it to the legislature. We finally got it passed in 1982 when I joined the legislature. Okay, um, the, the key there is that thing is now old. We've changed it. It's important. I'll fight to the death to keep it, but it doesn't need to evolve. The Utility Resource Planning Act, for those of you who don't know, please learn it. That's how you look at what is the least cost option. We have to adjust that as we morph into this new energy world. The RPS, that has to be addressed. Don't be afraid to go back and help evolve this to make it a better energy policy. Please don't. Um, and I'll close with this. Thank you, first of all, for your, your patience and understanding. Sir, you did have an excellent question, because I love energy efficiency. We dealt with it when I was there. And I'm sorry it has uh, fallen behind uh, medical marijuana or something else. I don't understand. Um, I mean, I grew up in the 60s in the Bay Area. That's when I went to college, and I still don't get marijuana. But I must have missed the memo. Um, I want to close with this. I want to thank these folks. These are the experts. These are the people whose name is on the line all the time doing this. I want to thank uh, Jennifer who invited me and, and her, her, her group, but mostly I want to I acknowledge someone in the back of the room. Sig Rogich is on the board that pulled this thing off and pulled it together. He and I have been friends for many, many, many years. Ne neither of us want to admit how long. But I can tell you, this is a guy who works at all levels, not just local government, not just state government, not just Washington. He works around the world. The things that he shared with me this morning, there's some very exciting opportunities. We have to open our minds to that. We can't be worried about what the next rate is going to be. You can't put this on Eric's head and say, Eric, why are my rates so high? Well, I'll give you 20 reasons, but you don't want to hear any of them. My wife doesn't like our power bill either. So I said, well, honey, call the, you know, call two guys. Um, call the window guy, and you call the insulation guy. Take out all the windows, 
and have the insulation put in and put the windows back. Well, how much is that going to cost? A lot. Those are the realities. So do you want to put solar panels up? How much is that going to cost? Okay, I can't give you every answer you want to hear. But collectively, we can make changes that are going to improve all of our lives. I want to throw this out to you, and this is where we end. I've thought about this for 10 years. I give this to my, my good friend, Steve Hill. I am sure uh, Todd Foley's going to analyze this. Um, Sarah may run out of here screaming. And of course, Jeremy is going to analyze it financially to death. We right now, and this includes a number of things that Senator Titus and I were involved in. Give a lot of incentives for bring companies here. A lot of incentives, all kinds of incentives. Some of them erode some of the things we'd like to do, whether it's in education or other things. Here's something I would like to have analyzed, because I've been thinking about this for 10 years. Take away every incentive, every incentive and go to what kind of state do you want? And hand pick the companies you want coming here. Hand pick the investors you want coming here. And here's what you're gonna do. The state right now uses approximately 100 megawatts of power. What you need to do is contract for 25 additional megawatts of clean energy, which the state would own. And that is your incentive bring companies here. Please think about that. Have a wonderful day, and I'm honored to have been here, and thank you for your interest.